Mr. Jovanovic, you are the uh, former Yugoslav uh, foreign minister, and uh, you were in charge of the uh, negotiations in uh, Rambouillet. Is that correct, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, I was uh, a foreign minister of Yugoslavia at the time of so-called uh, negotiations in Rambouillet and Paris. I was not the member of uh, Serbian Yugoslav delegation in Rambouillet and Paris, but let me say uh, I was a kind of logistics from Belgrade to the Serbo Serbian Yugoslav delegation in uh, Rambouillet. Um, today, uh, 13 years after so-called negotiations, uh, still continue to exist some distortions about those events. First of all, um, Serbia and Yugoslavia uh, accepted invitation from contact group to participate at negotiations for peaceful settlement of the Kosovo and Metohija problem. They came to Rambouillet with goodwill and uh, with uh, conviction that there uh, would be negotiation process there. However, days and weeks have elapsed and uh, there were no real negotiations in Rambouillet nor in Paris. Uh, the Serb Yugoslav delegation never sit, never sat together with Albanian delegation to negotiate political peaceful settlement. What was in place was so called uh, 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 diplomacy through uh, international negotiators. There were at least three principal so-called international negotiator. One was uh, Christopher Hill, uh, USA ambassador. The other was uh, Ambassador Majorski on behalf of Russia. And the third was uh, Petric, uh, negotiator on behalf of European Union. As I presume, Austria at the time was uh, chairing uh, the EU. Uh, Serb-Yugoslav delegation from the very beginning insisted on direct talks instead of so-called shuttle diplomacy process. But um, Christopher Hill, who was apparently one of three international negotiators and in fact who was the boss of the whole uh, exercise, would always uh, respond that apparently Albanian team would not accept direct talks with Serb Yugoslav delegation. So what he did, he would take some reactions from one side and interpret uh, on his own way to the other side. And so in rounds and rounds there were no, um, there was no uh, progress whatsoever. One distortion about uh, these uh, um, negotiations was that there was a paper to negotiate about. In fact, there was no in integral paper, integral uh, proposal of the agreement of the settlement. But instead, uh, Christopher Hill would present Serb-Yugoslav delegation three or four or five pages of uh, apparent chapter of wider text of the agreement which never was seen and which never appeared at the table. And then uh, 
after hearing uh, reactions of Serb Yugoslav delegation to this chapter, he would go back to the Albanians and what was his interpretation of the Serb Yugoslav position, uh, Serb Yugoslav delegation never was aware about. So what I presume there was a lot of manipulation in, in this uh, so-called shuttle diplomacy negotiation process. So are you saying that uh, the Western nations, NATO nations really had decided on bombing before they went to the WA talks? Well, uh, it was not Yugoslav or Serbian side who um, declared that uh, uh, the NATO side uh, presented such a text of apparent agreement that would definitely not be acceptable to Serb Yugoslav side, but not only the text of the document which would not be acceptable to any sovereign state in the world. These conclusions were of Henry Kissinger and of many other uh, diplomats, uh, statesmen and scholars. There were such a proposals, such a provisions in the so-called agreement uh, that uh, neglect entirely and negate sovereignty and elementary uh, principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity of states. Let me, for instance, uh, refer to provisions such as that Yugoslavia would be required to allow uh, disposal, uh, to, the, to allow uh, troops, NATO troops on the whole of its territory, including Serbia Inna, Vojvodina, Montenegro and Kosovo itself. It was not a requirement to have troops or presence of NATO only in the province of Kosovo and Metohia, but it was compulsory um, uh, request that uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia accept uh, the whole territory be covered by NATO troops. Yeah, that is without criminal responsibility or compensation of any kind. Exactly. Th there was a provision, there is a provision. Here we have in front of ourselves uh, the text of so-called um, uh, Rambouillet Agreement. Yugoslavia would have to accept immunity from legal process in respect of words spoken or written and any acts performed by NATO troops while on the territory of Yugoslavia. They would be exempt from any taxation. They would be also, imagine, authorized to detain individuals or uh, citizens of Yugoslavia without any explanation, without any decision, without uh, any, uh, uh, any consent of the Yugoslav authority. Imagine, this is, this is annex of the agreement and uh, it is uh, 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 written in the point 21 here which says NATO is authorized to detain individuals. Which individuals? Citizens of Yugoslavia, without any approval, without any notification, without any written decision. Now, if you add this to this um, provision, another one preceding, which says NATO personnel can uh, be in civilian suits, not necessarily in uniforms, while civilian 
they can be armed, they can carry arms all over Yugoslavia, being civilians to anybody. And those NATO civilians, apparently civilians, could detain any personality, any citizens of Yugoslavia. Where do you have such a provisions? Uh, how could you compare these provisions to SOFA or any other agreement, let's say, which NATO has with some other states? Like Albania, Macedonia, I was uh, speaking to the uh, current Norwegian ambassador to Kosovo, uh, uh, Jan Brotu, and he, he's uh, saying that this is something any country would accept. Uh, listen, I don't know agreements of those territories or those countries with NATO. But I know very well what was uh, written and tabled to Serb Yugoslav delegation in Rambouillet in Paris. And I read, NATO is authorized to detain individuals, should be read, to detain citizens of Yugoslavia where in Yugoslav territory. Is there any example of such authority in the world practice? Is there any country which would accept that foreign troops could uh, arbitrarily uh, detain, imprison citizens of another country. You know, I am uh, uh, educated as a jurist. I never practice law. But I know that the provisions which give higher authority, wider, larger authority to foreign citizens in a territory of certain country than the citizens of that country have is characterized as a, as a um, uh, not occupation, but capitulation. This is capitulation uh, provision uh, known as a category in the international law. If a citizen, foreign citizen, has wider rights on a territory of certain country than citizens of that country, then it is called capitulation system. So would you imagine any country in the world which would uh, voluntarily sign capitulation to beat any foreign country, any foreign organization, including NATO? So, in perspective of such a provision, you could see uh, actually the game to present apparent, apparent agreement which could not be accepted. Party which refuses such, an, such a capitulation would be accused of not being cooperative, not too willing to have peace. Therefore, the message is to the public of Western countries, United States or Norway or Germany or Britain, there is no other way than to bomb that country. They don't accept peaceful settlement. What actually they don't accept, they don't accept capitulation. They don't accept subjugation of own country. They don't accept uh, to be exception of the uh, in the world relations. But uh, Mr. Jovanovic, now I have uh, been talking to a uh, former uh, Prime Minister of Norway, Sel Magne Bonnevik, and uh, he's saying that uh, they tried again and again to have a peaceful solution with Mr. Milosevic. And uh, he's saying that, uh, that uh, Norway and NATO had no other option but go to war. What is your comment? Listen, uh, I think that uh, these people uh, have a feeling of guilt which they cannot consume and uh, they cannot admit that uh, they were committing a crime, a crime against peace, which is ultimate crime in international relations. They uh, undertook aggression against sovereign European country without respect to any international law, any international principle, uh, bluntly violating UN Charter, Helsinki Charter, Paris Charter, 
uh, Geneva Conventions and so on. Why they did it without approval of Security Council, the highest and the most responsible body for peace and stability in the world? Because they knew very well that they were uh, wrongdoers, that this would not have approval. Uh, as those people, if they would ever accept foreign power, be it, or, be it international organization or individual country, would have a right to jail citizens of their own countries without any law, legal decision. Would they accept provision, let's say, I read from that so-called Rambouillet Agreement, the right of NATO to use all the electronic, electromagnetic spectrum for their purpose. This, do they know the meaning of, uh, of this provision? That means that NATO would be authorized to occupy any television in Yugoslavia, to occupy any radio station any time, to occupy a radio communication of uh, ambulance, of police, of to use the electromagnetic spectrum totally without any decision, without any justification, without any compensation, without uh, being responsible to anybody. They just have provision that NATO officers could walk to RTS television and say, people, get away, we have something to do on your channels, on your electromagnetic channels, we have something to announce and so on. This uh, is not disrespect, but this is even subjugation. This is equal to a racistic uh, approach to one European nation. So I think I, I, can, um, I can understand uh, the people who uh, put the blame to the victim because it is very unpleasant for them uh, to admit uh, that they committed crime, crime against peace and stability, which is uh, sentenced, which is um, uh, envisaged by UN Charter and by, by uh, the basic principle, principles of international law. Take the provisions, provisions in the uh, point 17. NATO and NATO personnel shall be immune from claims of any sort which arise of their activities on the territory of Yugoslavia. This practically means they are irresponsible even if they are killing somebody. They, let's say, there were cases that uh, NATO soldiers get drunk in a uh, a restaurant and they uh, disbehave and uh, that they enter uh, some incidental situations. So if they kill somebody, if they kill with vehicles or with, uh, uh, in, in fighting with somebody and so on, they are irresponsible, that there is no authority um, on them. There is no way of Serbia or Yugoslavia claiming uh, uh, a right to sue them or something. So this is why I characterize Rambouillet agreement as an offer of capitulation and not uh, of any solution. Yugoslavia at the time really had all reasons to have just peaceful political solution and to get uh, peace and stability to pursue the objectives of progress, uh, social, e economic development and so on. But they did not want this. They wanted simply a theater in Rambouillet uh, with the objective to justify 
premeditated and pre-planned um, uh, aggression, military action. We, you know that uh, so-called negotiations, although there were no negotiations, as I said before, um, uh, they, they um, threatened before Rambouillet uh, with NATO action. So what kind of negotiations you would have if you have, let's say, stealth bombers uh, or B-52 bombers above your head? You are supposed to negotiate peace while uh, the whole NATO machinery threatens to destroy you. And uh, in addition, uh, in addition, Albanian delegation uh, in uh, Rambouillet did not have interest at all to negotiate because they knew that they were staging negotiations in order to have Yugoslavia bombed afterwards. They did not have any interest to negotiate or to uh, come to a compromise. They had the whole team of American experts behind them. Uh, Mr. I think Mr. Abramovitz from Washington was uh, heading American team of advisors to Tachi and to other uh, Albanians uh, who were representing Albanian minority in Paris. And in addition, they had American administration behind. They had a uh, Christopher Hill who was acting on their behalf. But uh, Mr. Juranovic, um, I'm speaking to uh, uh, the current ambassador to Kosovo, Norwegian ambassador, Jan Brotu, and uh, he is saying that no one in the Albanian delegation wanted war. What is your comment to that? Well, uh, I think anybody is allowed to say anything, even to say nonsense. Uh, Mrs. Albright and Americans told Albanian delegation in uh, Rambouillet, do sign this text and uh, you will have NATO bombing Serbia and Yugoslavia. And uh, Albanians did everything to provoke NATO intervention because they knew that secession was impossible by political means Secession was not possible because of international law. So the only hope for terrorist organization uh, was uh, NATO intervention. So they first got cooperation of the so-called OEC, Kosovo Verification Mission. They had over 1,000 uh, spies covered by uh, OEC mission over there uh, all over Kosovo and Metohia to prop up mm, dramatization of situation in Kosovo and Metohia and then to prepare the atmosphere which would justify mm, uh, military intervention. So Kosovo verification mission instead of uh, verifying ceasefire, instead of verifying uh, uh, political process uh, headed by um, uh, American ambassador Walker had an ultimate mission to dramatize the situation in Kosovo and Metohia to the point which would justify bombing of Yugoslavia. And that's why uh, inventing the Ratak massacre, uh, which has proved by now to have been staged, and that it, there was no um, uh, any ground to characterize this as a, a massacre of civilians. You know, for instance, that uh, Ratchak, so-called Ratchak massacre, was a number one accusation against Milosevic in, um, in the Hague Tribunal. But when it came to have defense of Milosevic, they just dropped the charge about Ratchak. Why, if it was a massacre, of civilians, why they dropped it? Because they knew it was staged, it was not right. The other example was so-called uh, 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 horseshoe uh, or Potkova, 
which was invention of uh, uh, then uh, German Minister of Defense. Joschka Fischer. You, no, Joschka Fischer was a Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, uh, it was... Rudolf Scharping. Uh, Scharping, of course. He invented this theory of horseshoe that uh, apparently Milosevic and Yugoslav government who wanted to push all Albanians out from Kosovo and Metohia were to Adriatic Sea or something other uh, a crazy idea uh, which has proved uh, even uh, years back to be fal falsification, to be uh, just invention aimed at getting, getting support of German public for the first war of Germany after the Second World War. Germany had a problem of uh, entering the uh, uh, aggression against Serbia um, because of resistance in German public. So they invented this horseshoe theory uh, to convince German public it was inevitable Germany to go. And what was the objective for Germany? Was to throw away the narrow tailored uh, jackets uh, tailored to them by allied forces after the Second World War and to suddenly appear as a military power. But uh, was this a service to peace? Was this a service to Europe? Well, uh, they say it's humanitarian intervention for the sake of peace. Well, let me remind you that Hitler said decades ago that he had humanitarian problems of German national minority in Sudeten, in Czechoslovakia, so he uh, obliged Chamberlain and uh, 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 Daladier, prime ministers of uh, Britain and uh, France, to agree for secession of uh, Sudeten in order, what, to protect human rights of German minority in, Sude in Sudeten. And uh, after this uh, Berzgaden agreement, it was kind of a uh, Rambouillet agreement at the time. Uh, Chamberlain and Dal Daladier, Chamber Chamberlain, when he got out of the uh, airplane in London Heathrow Airport, he said, the peace is secured. And it was just the beginning of the Second World War. Uh, I really cannot avoid this association, this reminiscence of the uh, atmosphere uh, before the Second World War. But uh, I cannot see any good reason, any good favor to Europe or to peace that Germany, uh, known for crimes in the Second World War, entered again the war against Serbia and Yugoslavia so many years after. The wounds of the Second World War which Germany provoked against Serbia have not been healed. And Germany was the last country to have any reasonable uh, objective to enter the NATO aggression against, uh, against Serbia. This was not, now everybody knows, humanitarian or any kind of intervention. This was blatant aggression against a sovereign country participated among others by Germany. It was the first war on European soil after the Second War. It was the first war of Germany after the Second World War. It was precedent, as we know all today, justified then by avoiding humanitarian catastrophe, but repeated after that in uh, uh, Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, not long ago in Libya, in Libya to save civilians. Which way? To kill them and save them. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, 
threats to repeat this all over. What I say uh, now, today, 13 years after, say, uh, at the same time is said by so many people and statesmen all over the world. It is recognized even by United States of America that United States needed precedent which would be used later on. It was put in Britain at the conference of NATO countries at the end of April 2000, in the year 2000 in Bratislava, when Americans admitted the war against Yugoslavia was provoked by mistake of Dwight Eisenhower during the Second World War. That's why we needed the war to cover up this position of American troops in the, um, in the region. And Bond Steel is witnessing this strategy that the aggression was needed. Number one, as a precedent which would be followed later on in so many instances, and as a correction of Dwight Eisenhower's mistake during the Second World War, which omitted at the time to have American troops on the Balkan Peninsula. And it was also the strategy of expanding NATO toward the East. So it is, I'm sorry, I'm awfully sorry to say Norway, a small European country, friendly, with a friendly people towards Serbia, has taken active role in this aggression. And that not only that, um, statesmen, including foreign minister and the government of Norway, have taken very active, not leading, but almost leading role in preparing atmosphere to justify criminal war, first criminal war after the second war, war in, um, uh, 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 in, in that period. Now, let's see what has been achieved. What has been achieved? Humanitarian objectives? Ask your friends, your uh, compatriots, what happens with 230,000 of Serbs which have been expelled during and after NATO aggression from Kosovo and Metohia? None is permitted to return to Kosovo and Metohia, to their ancestors, houses, homes and immovables, to their farms, to their jobs, to their houses and so on. How come that your country and people whom you are mentioning do care about humanitarian uh, problems and nobody cares about free and safe return of 230,000 of Serbs and other non-Albanians which still 13 years after cannot return to Kosovo and Metohia. How they justify this? What is the reason? What, 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 what they are undertaking today? Where is the resolution um, uh, of Security Council 1244 which guarantees free, safe and dignified return of all displaced and all refugees? Is uh, this care, this apparent care of human, uh, about human beings being applied to Serbs also or it is not? Uh, you know that there is a theory, ethnic cleansing is not acceptable, but maybe functional, maybe, maybe sometimes necessary, when it is necessary, when Serbs are concerned. Well, it's, it's interesting you, you mentioned this because when I spoke to former uh, Prime Minister Selma Nebonovic, he denied that uh, ethnic cleansing of Serbs had uh, been taking place. After our bombing, he said it was uh, ethnic movement, but not ethnic cleansing. What is uh, your response to what the Norwegian Prime Minister has said? Uh, I think uh, um, this person has very serious problems, uh, which uh, may be uh, fall in the sphere of logics uh, or uh, uh, 
or simply uh, problems in language uh, and so on. Uh, if you have 250,000 Serbs and non-Albanians forced to leave Kosovo and Metohia after NATO aggression, then who would claim they do that voluntarily? They leave the, their homes, they leave their assets, immovables, they leave graveyards, they leave churches and monasteries in Kosovo and Metohia voluntarily. Who can believe this? Who, uh, I don't know, I don't know um, the, the, the uh, attitude of Norwegian public, but I cannot imagine that Norwegian public would consume such, such nonsenses. Oh, well, if they have left one reason or the other, why now they are not permitted to go back? Is international community, including Norway, feeling obliged to secure secure environment for Serbs the same way as they secured to Muslims in Bosnia, to Croats in Croatia, to... Um, Serbs in Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, Serbs in Ukraine. Serbs in Ukraine, still hundreds of thousands uh, are in Belgrade, many of them so many years living in, in uh, so-called uh, co concentration uh, uh, centers for collective, for collective, uh, well, housing. I imagine in Europe so. And uh, if, uh, if people like those ones who you are referring to care for freedom and for humanitarian uh, criteria, how they would explain that Serbs in Kosovo and Metohia, that I think 80,000, how many have uh, stayed in Kosovo and Metohia, many of them living today in uh, ghettos uh, with barbed wires uh, and in the presence of international community. Now we have enriched international community. In addition to uh, UNMIC and K4, now we have uh, ULEX, EULEX, we have some other structures over there. What they do there? How would those persons explain the, the uh, situation where no one Albanian has taken responsible for crimes against Serbs in Kosovo and Metohia. Today, you 150 Serbian monasteries and churches destroyed by Albanians in Kosovo and Metohia. 150 medieval um, uh, monuments of European culture, of Christian culture, have been destroyed in Kosovo and Metohia. How they would explain that nobody has been taken responsible for so many crimes, for massive crimes, including massive uh, killings of Serbs, like in Kletchka, like in the buses, which have been uh, blown up by bombs and so on and so forth, like kids killed in the uh, bistros and cafes in uh, Kosovo and Metohia. Do those people have any response? Ha can they say who is to be blamed for, for this situation? Uh, or they think it is not necessary to blame in the interests of reconciliation and stability. We better forget about that. Is this is this uh, care, caring about uh, universal humanitarian standards, about universal democratic standards, and so on? Do they? How come they do not feel ashamed of the present situation of Serbs in Kosovo and Metohia? You see, every day some Serbs have been jailed to death, so many years after in Kosovo and Metohia, in the presence of so many international structures over there and uh, no response what I what I uh, uh, pity very much that is Serbian government even is not caring enough about Serbs in Kosovo and Metohia what what is 
happening with uh, European civilization? Do they, are they, is anybody among them aware what does it mean depriving Europe of 150 medieval uh, European m m monuments in Kosovo and Metohia? How they, uh, where is morality, where is, uh, where is responsibility, where is integrity, uh, political integrity, uh, 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 intellectual integrity, personal integrity of such persons that you are mentioning, wh whose names you are mentioning uh, right now. Well, um, Mr. Cel Magna Bonovic, he left he, he, after 2005. He was no longer the prime minister and left politics. And he is now leading the Oslo Center for Peace and Reconciliation. What do you think about the man who started Norway's first war for over 200 years, and now he's the leader for a Center for Peace and Reconciliation? Uh, where is based this Center for Peace? In Oslo. In Oslo. Well, uh, this is a matter of uh, Oslo government and uh, of uh, the, the nation of uh, Norway to, to answer. Uh, what I see, some Norwegian uh, members of government uh, uh, heading today some international organizations and so on and so forth. Uh, what I think, sincerely, I think that um, this imperialistic policy of NATO uh, cares about own servicemen. Do you understand what I mean? They care about services rendered by those personalities to the imperial policy of NATO. NATO is clearly today aggressive military alliance which has ambition to intervene at any spot on the globe without respecting Security Council, UN Charter, Helsinki Final Document, Paris Charter, and so on. So, uh, uh, so they are getting rewards, including some uh, Norwegian ministers. I think Mr. Wollebeck is heading also kind of international. We're speaking about uh, Knut Wollebeck. He was the former foreign minister by the time Norway went to war in 99. That's right. He did good service. He served purposes of NATO, but I doubt very much if he served the purposes of European civilization. Well, uh, I spoke to him uh, some months ago. And he's saying that he's promoting peace and reconciliation in Kosovo. I don't know uh, if he has changed his methods, but at the time uh, that I was in contact with him, uh, he did care only about rendering good service to NATO and, let me say, to the United States. This was, I think, uh, his role, whether he was I, I cannot imagine that he was not conscious of the role he had played. And uh, while I had uh, several meetings with him, uh, while you are talking to him, uh, everything is fine. But when you face him with uh, real arguments, he would just smile and remain without answer. When he gets into conflicts with, um, uh, with uh, objectives with facts, he would say he didn't know that. For instance, I know about his witnessing to, to the proceedings in the um, uh, Hague Tribunal. So he said, well, asked by judge, why didn't you care more about uh, agreement Milosevic-Holbrook of the 13th of October 1998? And he said, Yes, I was chairman in office of the OECE, but I didn't know the content of the milosevic holbrook agreement. So how can you claim to be successful, to be 
uh, purpose-wise to serve the purpose of peace and you didn't know such a, a very important um, agreement as Milosevic Holbrook because it was agreement between United States government and the government of Yugoslavia and it uh, did define the role of OECE presided by Mr. Knut Wolbeck but it was not possible for him to say that he knew the content but he didn't follow uh, this. For do, you, do you think he knew? Well, uh, uh, it is not a logic. Uh, it was not possible for him to perform his duty as chair, chairman of the office of OEC without knowing uh, in details agreements. Um, I think he was asked by a judge, didn't you talk to Holbrook? And he said he didn't have opportunity to talk to Holbrook. Well, what the essence was, the whole operation with the role of Knut Wollebeck served the imperial interests of United States. Yet Mr. Wollebeck didn't know uh, the agreement between United States and uh, 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 Yugoslavia defining the OEC mission in Kosovo and Metohia. So for instance, he, he, uh, he claimed, for instance, that um, Vokar, head of KVM, Kosovo Verification Mission. And we were speaking about William Walker. That William is, Walker, yeah. American ambassador. The, the, uh, who was heading Kosovo Veri Verification Mission uh, on, on behalf of the OC. Yes, I'm talking about um, uh, Mr. Walker, American uh, ambassador. Uh, who was a head of OEC mission and who was apparently responsible to Mr. Wolebeck uh, uh, as a chairman uh, in office of uh, KVM. Apparently, uh, Mr. Garamek and uh, a Polish foreign minister who was chairman in office of OEC before, Knut Wolebeck, and Knut Wolebeck, they, uh, they were instructing um, Walker, Walker and KVM mission in Kosovo and Metohia. What in fact was, it was vice versa. The Walker, although heading KVM mission, was instructing Volebek and Geramek in any sense of that world. He You're was a commander. He was commander. I know from other friends, I had many friends in international community who told me when Walker was in Kosovo and Metohia, he would, would only spread more dramatization, more dramatization. It is too quiet. Let us, let us do events which would make tensions in Kosovo and Metohia. This was his role and his objectives. And he had a support, he had assistance of uh, uh, Geramek and uh, of Volebek. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but I am very frank. Uh, Geramek and uh, Volebek probably uh, think the best of themselves, but they were in American service. So you're and saying he really worked for William Walker, but when William Walker was, in theory, reporting to Knut Volebek? Exactly. Because, uh, for instance, what Wolebeck was demanding from me, he was demanding uh, that Walker had um, uh, own helicopters. Provided it, by whom? Provided by NATO or by NATO country, never mind. He was also demanding that Walker and his entourage be armed, be armed, I don't know with what kind, I don't recall with what kind of armaments and so on. And many such requests. To those requests, I was responding. We, all those small country and poor country, we have excellent helicopters. We have excellent pilots. And we put on disposal, without any limitation, our helicopters and crews to Walker and to Kaveh mission without any charge. They would be on service of Walker. Ah, oh, no, this was not acceptable. Why? They wanted helicopters 
of NATO and NATO personnel, which do what? Which would uh, prop up tensions in Kosovo and Metohia. Then about armament, we said, you are our guests as the whole KVM, as the whole Kosovo verification mission. There were over 1,000 of uh, uh, personnel of KVM mission. And uh, we said, we guarantee security. We are sovereign country. We have experience how to protect you. Don't worry. But they, they didn't accept. Then finally I told Knut, Knut, can you see the agreement that I have signed with uh, a Polish um, uh, foreign minister uh, preceding chairman in office of OECE in Vienna, you see how the things have been uh, envisaged in this agreement. Where do you see helicopters? Where do you see armament to KV mission? Didn't we agree that this is entirely civil diplomatic, civic diplomatic mission without armament, without uh, a, a military equipment and so on? Didn't we guarantee all uh, logistics to cover a mission? And uh, they uh, would say, well, yes, the agreement doesn't have such a provision, but we insist. Under what criteria you insist? So this uncovers another phase of international community part of which was your government, Norwegian government and uh, Mr. Knut Wollebeck, that it really doesn't matter what they signed. It really doesn't matter what obligation they accept. They do sign and do accept only for opportunistic reasons to do something at the moment. Next moment they say, this is not valid. We go we go away from that. Illustration is the attitude of international, so-called international uh, community toward the resolution uh, 1244 of uh, Security Council. You know, among other things, uh, this resolution guarantees sovereignty and territorial integrity of Serbia, solu political solution of the status of Kosovo and Metohia as substantial autonomy within Serbia. This resolution also guarantee contingents of uh, uh, military and police of Serbia to be on the territory of Kosovo and Metohia. How many uh, Serbian police officers uh, are now present in, in Kosovo representing the government of uh, Belgrade? None. There are no, uh, uh, it is envisaged and it was said, you know, uh, the formulation from resolution. Hundreds, not thousands. This is exact formulation. Hundreds, not thousands. This practically means that Serbia would be entitled to have 1,999 policemen and uh, military personnel in Kosovo and Metohia. One less than 2,000, because 1,999 is not thousands. It is 1,999. Well, uh, they claim it is only 1,000, but actually it is 1,999. This is exactly what Serbia can claim. But none has been permitted. And you know uh, provisions in the resolution are that those people would, among other things, be uh, stationed at the border crossings. Border crossings are clear illustration of sovereignty and territorial integrity. So if you have Serbian policemen and military in border crossings toward uh, Macedonia toward Albania, that means that all territory north, north of these borders belong to Serbia. You would have Serbian flags uh, on those border crossings. You would have Serbian uh, customs and Serbian um, uh, 
police control, but uh, this uh, they refuse. Uh, then you have provision, as I mentioned, that all refugees and displaced persons have a right to free and safe return. Now, everybody has returned except 230,000 Serbs and other non-Albanians who even today live in centers of collective accommodation in Belgrade and so on. You know that there are, there are hundreds of children in those centers for collective accommodation uh, in Belgrade. Uh, two months ago, uh, my organization, my civic association, has helped 250 uh, school, uh, uh, school boys and girls uh, with uh, some modest uh, assistance. They all are from Kosovo, but they cannot return to Kosovo. And this is a real face of uh, democratic and human face of uh, Europe and international community. You have also provision uh, in resolution 1244 of economic reconstruction of Yugoslavia. Where is it? I don't know, but uh, what you're referring to the uh, police officers and everything, uh, then you're referring to United Nations Security Council resolution 1244. That's exactly uh, very uh, uh, specific paragraph refers to the right of Serbian police to return contingents of Serbian police and army uh, is entitled to return to Kosovo Metohija to be on border crossings to be uh, guaranteeing security of monasteries and cultural monuments Serbian monuments in Kosovo and Metohija, and to take part in the mining and decontamination of Kosovo and Metohija. Three purposes. About 2,000 is not a small number of policemen and uh, military personnel. It is quite enough to, uh, to contribute to political solution, to contribute to peace and uh, stability over there. Today, today, what Europe says today that with all efforts, with military, uh, civilian, uh, uh, legal, uh, pol uh, police presence in Kosovo and Metohija, we day from day we, le uh, we read and listen media saying about the concept of Greater Albania. This, uh, uh, these Albanians in Macedonia and uh, in northern Greece and in southern Montenegro uh, from Serbia, they uh, have uh, facilities to meet in Tirana and they, the other day, one week ago, they uh, delivered declaration about the right of all Albanians to live in one state. Now, you recall the, uh, the thesis that it is an acceptable policy, all Serbs to live in one state. Now nobody has any reaction to the call from Tirana of representatives of Albanians from Kosovo and Metohija, from southern districts of Serbia, from Macedonia, northern uh, Greece and southern Montenegro, which have come with a public declaration, written declaration, Albanians have a right to live in one state. Well, in Pristina, I've been uh, buying maps uh, with Albania with borders up to Nish. Well, uh, this is one of, uh, uh, of the boomerangs of the policy, uh, humanitarian policy of OEC, of uh, European Union, and so on and so forth. What I am actually uh, suggesting is that uh, NATO aggression from 1999 has done harm to peace and stability in the Balkan and in Europe. And that uh, has uh, brought nothing positive. It was only seeding seeds of today's and future instability of Europe. 
I really don't believe that uh, so-called independent Kosovo Republic uh, will serve any reasonable purpose of um, progress in Europe. It will be the source of lasting instability of Europe. And uh, I also would like to hear the message. Peace and stability in the Balkans cannot be imposed by force, blackmail, by financial uh, conditions, by so-called European orientations, candidacy, and so on. Peace in the Balkan and peace in Kosovo and Metohia, stability and progress in this part of the world of Europe can be secured only based on compromise. Compromise means that Europe would be doing much better respecting legitimate interests of Serbia, which have been completely neglected by now. Europe is misled by so-called cooperative policy of the Serbian government up to now. This is not the policy which, uh, uh, which is uh, reflecting a real mood of citizens of Serbia. It is reflecting uh, only obeyance uh, toward uh, some political commissars in Brussels, be it in headquarters of NATO or headquarters of European Union. Mr. Jovanovic, thank you very much for your time. Um, in closing, is there anything you'd like to mention that we did not cover so far? What I would like to say actually is a part of history and part of much better history than it is part of presence. Serbia and Norway have been traditional friends. Serbia has been among leading force anti-fascistic forces during the Second World War. And Norway had also the anti-fascistic movement. Norway deserves our tribute and gratitude for accepting thousands of Ser Serbian prisoners of war, which were uh, transported from Germany to Norway. Norway was housing and offering, um, offering opportunity to thousands of Serbs during the Second World War. After the peace came to Europe, many Serbs have found home in Norway and uh, contributed to strengthening of understanding and friendship between Serbian nation and Norwegian nation. I really am sorry that the governments, especially the government of Norway uh, hurt this friendship and uh, provoked damage uh, that cannot be understandable, uh, especially damage in uh, taking part in the process of preparing and later in the process of executing uh, military aggression against Serbia which provoked at least 3,500 deaths, uh, over 10,000 uh, wounded, aggression, which will always in history remain a shame to Europe, including to Norwegian government at the time, as a crime and as an anti-civilization act. I hope that um, the future will bring more reasons in Oslo as well as in Belgrade 
and that we can return to build up our friendship on, based on the tradition uh, made during the Second World War and in the long period after the Second World War until criminal aggression in 1999. Thank you very much. Thank you.